Welcome. In this session of IntelliQuest's The World's 100 Greatest Books, you're going to learn about the classic novel The Red and the Black and its intense and fascinating author, Stendhal. Stendhal is actually a pseudonym. The author's real name was Henri Bale, but it was one of his quirks of character that he frequently used different aliases, 171 of them over his lifetime. While writing The Red and the Black, he was calling himself Baron Stendhal, even though there was an actual Baron Stendhal living in Sweden at the time. He claims to have taken the name Stendhal not from this man, but from a town in Germany. Stendhal created a style and philosophy in his books which he himself gave a name to. He called it Le Bélisme, after his family name of Bale. It describes the method of his books, a sense of style and composition that was all his own. It also describes his major theme, the search for happiness. The hero of Le Bélisme is a man who follows the lead of his senses and his instincts. He's seen as a member of a social group or on the margin of a social group, but he never bends to the rules that society tries to impose on him. Every one of Stendhal's heroes is in opposition to the social world in which he lives and serves. These heroes constantly cast doubt over every habit and characteristic of society. Because of this distrust, the hero makes many small discoveries by which he accumulates facts, and those facts lead to his sense of reality. Sentiments and morality have no role in these discoveries. They are only obstacles in an objective search for happiness. If man is to achieve happiness, he must calculate his moves, estimate his chances, practice flattery, and build his own happiness based on what he knows of the ways of man and his skill at exploiting those ways. This is Stendhal's philosophy, the theme of his books, and the approach that defines le belisme. The philosophy of Stendhal can be traced in part to the chaotic times in which he lived. His life bridged two centuries in a way that none of his contemporaries did. He was born in the 18th century and died well into the 19th century. His birth occurred a few years before the French Revolution. He grew up during a time of violent upheaval. He went to school under the Directory, became an adolescent with the Consulate, reached manhood under the Empire of Napoleon, participated in the Napoleonic disaster in Russia, wrote half of his books under the Restoration and the other half during the July Monarchy, and died only a few years before another revolutionary storm was to shake France in 1842. Most of the other significant writers of his time were born after the revolution and were still boys when Napoleon fell. His unique experiences always increased Stendhal's sense of homelessness and his tragic awareness of time and change. He therefore became one of the first writers to speak for the so-called homeless, the intellectuals and searchers who lived on the margins of society, a society that was always in flux, but which had one consistent characteristic, the abuse of power. His heroes are condemned by society and often, like Julien Sorel and the Red and the Black, end up in prison. But they have found their dignity and their salvation in not playing the game of this society and in accepting their own private prisons. They are strangers in society who struggle for independence and survival with whatever weapons they have. These weapons may not always be noble, they may include hypocrisy or role-playing, but they protect the hero's truest beliefs and opinions which have no outlet in society. Although he wrote throughout most of his life, Stendhal didn't begin writing novels until later in life. He published his first one, Armance, when he was forty-four. He was forty-seven when he wrote The Red and the Black, and he wrote his last novel, La Chartreuse de Parme, when he was fifty-six. Each of these three important novels are about young men. His stories explore the aspirations and disappointments of the coming of age. They're about the young man's first impressions of life, his first important ideas, and the first awareness of his sensuality. Young readers are always able to identify with the three heroes from these books, and older readers are impressed by the intelligence and accuracy with which Stendhal portrays youth. The story of Julien Sorel, the hero of The Red and the Black, is a rich treatment of human life that was neither recognized nor appreciated by the readers and critics of the time. The book was considered evil, immoral, and irresponsible. Its true greatness would be realized years later, as Stendhal himself predicted. The title of the book has a surface meaning and several deeper meanings, depending on your interpretation. On the surface, red is meant to refer to the color of the uniforms of Napoleon's soldiers. Black is the color of the robes of the clergy. The hero, Julien Sorel, wears that robe, but his heart belongs to the glorious days of Napoleonic France that had preceded him. Stendhal was future-minded, but he was also a man of his times, and he wrote of what surrounded him. What surrounded him in the 1830s was the Napoleonic legend and the power of the Jesuits. The title suggests other ideas, too. It seems to announce the two extremes of human life, 
of which one will be lost and one gained, as in a game of chance where the roulette wheel stops at either red or black. The prize is either happiness or unhappiness. Henri Bale was born on January 23, 1783, in Grenoble, at that time a city of 25,000 inhabitants. He was born to a well-to-do bourgeois family. His father, Cherubin Bale, was a barrister in the Grenoble Parliament and would one day be deputy mayor of the city. His mother, Henriette Gagnon, was the daughter of a physician. She died when Henri was only seven, but he worshipped her in memory his entire life. Mrs. Bale came from a cultured family and was fond of the arts. Stendhal always claimed that she was of Italian descent and liked to think he continued her Italian traits and temperament. After his mother died, he despised his life at home, particularly his father's ideas and his love for money. He spent as much time as possible at his beloved grandfather's house, where he liked to sit on the terrace and watch the sunset over the mountains. Henri's father hired a priest tutor to teach his son manners and make him respectful of authority. But Henri saw the man as a tyrant, and his hated presence in the house eventually caused Henri to break away from his father and from the church. Under the oppressive treatment of the priest, his father, and a domineering aunt who ran his grandfather's house, Henri grew into a boy who was strongly individualistic and disrespectful. These three represented to him not only the bourgeoisie of Grenoble, but humanity itself. Alienated from his family and having no friends, he said later he was never allowed to play with other boys, he repressed all feelings of affection. He even turned against his grandfather when he was punished by that man in front of the entire family. His suffering seemed to bring about a growing sense of physical and spiritual needs. He could be moved to tears by the sound of bells and elated by the slightest attention of those he liked, such as his uncle, Romain Gagnon, his mother's brother. But he learned to savor these feelings inwardly and not to express them. Henri had no outlets in the way of exercise or sports. He was cloistered and overprotected, deprived of all normal boyhood activities. He replaced these with daydreaming and introverted thinking, which lasted his whole life. At the age of ten he was reading fanciful forbidden books, and at the age of twelve he was writing comedies. Between thirteen and fourteen he entered school in Grenoble and experienced his first taste of freedom. He was an excellent pupil who won first prizes in mathematics. His literature teacher emphasized the classics of the seventeenth century, but also introduced him to Voltaire and Shakespeare. He continued to read Shakespeare his entire life. Henri made few friends at school. He was fairly fat and was teased for this by his companions. As early as fifteen, love was an all-important problem to Henri, and it would remain so until he died. He was obsessed with women, young and old, and desired almost every attractive female he saw. His talent in mathematics inspired Henri to try for entry into the prestigious L'Ecole Polytechnique in Paris, which he joyously saw as the long-awaited escape from his family and from Grenoble. He was seventeen when he reached Paris and knew nothing of the world except what he'd read in books. After he arrived, he found the preparations for the entrance exams into the university too troublesome, so he gave up the idea of studying math. He stayed with cousins of the family, who found him a modest secretarial position with the war office. But disappointed with his failure to secure a promotion, Henri left three months later to join the reserve army of Napoleon. He went to Milan with the army, and there began his love affair with Italy. He loved the music, the operas, the ballet, the landscape, and particularly the women. He fell in love with a woman named Angela Pietrogrua, but since she was the mistress of one of his companions, it was a secret love, practiced from afar. He would not become her lover until eleven years later. It was in Milan that Henri first began to keep a journal. He kept detailed diaries the rest of his life. In 1801 he resigned from the army and returned to Paris, determined to make a success of himself. By success he meant three things, to write, to become a proficient lover, and to secure himself a high place in the social world. His literary goal at that time was to become a poet in theatre, to replace Moliere as the new bard of comedies. But his entrance into society was filled with obstacles. He was poor, and to appear well in society one had to spend money. There were other obstacles, too. He was provincial and had an accent. He wasn't the least bit attractive. In fact, his uncle had once told him that because he was ugly he would have a hard time in Paris. Finally, he was insecure and aware of his own lack of worldliness. The realities of the social world turned out to be just the opposite of what he'd imagined in his fantasies. To cover his hurt and sense of inadequacy, he began to form a philosophy, a philosophy that he was unique and superior to the men around him, that he should remain apart from that vulgar world, that he was destined to be different and to be alone. As early as 1803, he remarked, in the present order of society, lofty souls must nearly always be unhappy. 
He continued to study, to write, to try and gain entrance with the theater crowd, and to pursue women. He was unsuccessful at most of these efforts. He fell in love with the young woman and followed her to Marseille, where his ardor faded, and he found himself glad when she returned to Paris. At this point he was given an official office in the war office and was present at Napoleon's entrance into Berlin in 1806. He stayed in Germany for two years, fell in love again, fell out of love again, cultivated a taste for Mozart, and began his change from an awkward bourgeois into a French dandy. In 1810 he returned to Paris again and lived the life of the bon vivant, enjoying theater, society, and the company of beautiful women. It was the happiest period in his life. He held a position in the imperial court and finally felt himself a Parisian and not a provincial. But the fall of Napoleon upset his plans and hopes. He returned to Milan in 1814 and wrote his first book, a biography of three composers, and then tried to answer the question of what kind of writer he should be, a musicologist, an art critic, or a literary critic. He developed a great passion for a woman named Matilda Dembowska, but although she inspired him with an understanding of love, they never became lovers. He returned to Paris in 1821 and in the next nine years published six books, including his first novel, Armand's. By then he had adopted the pseudonym Stendhal, and his name was beginning to be known in intellectual circles. But few recognized the fact that he was a great novelist. He himself said, I shall be understood about 1880. At another point he said, I have drawn a lottery ticket whose winning number is to be read in 1935. He was right on both counts, for his popularity was high in both those periods. He had grown into a somewhat obese, florid bon vivant, obsessed with strategies for conquering women. He was a prototype of the bachelor writer, the would-be adventurer in love and life, the lover of literature, music, painting, and good cooking. The seven years in Milan had initiated him into the pleasures of the senses and the pleasures of the mind, to freedom of spirit, to a love of natural beauty as well as to a love of the arts. It was during these years in Paris, in 1830, that he wrote The Red and the Black, inspired by a true crime story reported in the newspapers of his day. It was the story of a French peasant who was convicted of shooting his mistress and executed. The author used this event as a vehicle for his many ideas about society, nonconformity, and the search for happiness. In 1830, after he'd finished his book, he became a consul in the service of Louis-Philippe and was stationed close to Rome. It was a striking feature of Stendhal's life that he was always unsettled and moving from place to place. During most of his life he had no permanent home. He lived in furnished rooms, hotels, or lodgings, and he traveled about constantly. In the last thirty years of his life there were no more than four or five single years that were not marked by a major expedition of some sort. It was a rare event when he remained at the same address for as long as six months. On this latest visit to Italy, Stendhal found his government work tedious and petty. He escaped his boredom by spending five days of the week in the city of Rome itself. Despite bad health, he led an active social life, but his friendships with Roman ladies, like so many of his affairs, remained sentimental and didn't result in actual liaisons. As he grew older, he dreamed of love more and more and indulged in memories of affairs that had almost been successful. He had a persistent sadness about not being able to make any woman happy. In 1839, he wrote his third and last novel, La Chartreuse de Parme. Two years later, he had his first attack of apoplexy and suffered from then on with occasional loss of speech. He began to expect his death and hoped only that it would be swift and that he would be able to return home to France. He sailed from Italy in October 1841 with the knowledge he would never again return. Five months later in Paris, he had a massive stroke and died within a few hours at the age of 59. He had already written his epitaph, which read in Italian, Henri Bale of Milan, lived, wrote, and loved. This soul worshipped Cimarosa, Mozart, and Shakespeare. Since his death, his reputation has steadily grown, so that today his is one of the half-dozen greatest names in the development of the European novel. In his novels, he lays down at least a dozen themes which have engrossed the novelists that followed him. The revolt from the small village, the struggle against the father, the sense of social inferiority, the position of the intellectual, the declassed man, the realistic description of war, and the conflict between intellect and romanticism. In The Red and the Black, Stendhal became the first novelist to announce his theme clearly at the beginning of the book. He said, For Julien, achieving success meant first of all leaving Verrières. This idea of escaping the small town and all the restrictions and pettiness it represents is now a common one, but it's common because Stendhal invented it and others followed his lead. Stendhal wrote against the grain of current fiction, which was mostly costume romance at that time, and in so doing he created novels that anticipated by thirty years the psychological realism associated with modern fiction. 
In Julien himself, Stendhal created the first classic portrait of the hero as intellectual. He is lost. He is an outsider. Because in a society that has no place for intelligence, he is a man of brains. In the long run, he was what Stendhal himself was, an acute observer and student of the human mind, a psychologist. The red and the black set the tone and even the content for a hundred fine novels that followed it. Now let's meet the hero of the novel, and then we'll begin with the story itself. The hero of the book is Julien Sorel, just a young boy when the story opens. On the surface, Julien is pensive and girlish, but on the inside he has the spirit of a revolutionary. His favorite books are The Confessions of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Le Memorial de Saint-Hélène, and The Bulletins of Napoleon's Army. From reading these, he has developed an ambition to rise in the world, as a soldier of Napoleon would have. But Napoleon's days have passed. His only hope now lay in the church. The priest's black cassock is now his symbol of liberation, although he knows he will have to play certain games to enter into such a vocation. Julien is intelligent and better educated than most peasants. He is aware of his own inadequacies and suspicious of other people. He is constantly analyzing the actions and motives of both himself and others. He's a mix of intellect and romanticism, searching for love and happiness, and never sure whether he's attained either. The book opens in the small fictitious town of Verrières. The mayor of the town, Monsieur de Renal, is at odds with the highly respected parish priest, Abbot Chelan. Chelan had shown the town's prison and poorhouse to a visiting philanthropist on the recommendation of the town's Parisian benefactor, the Marquis de la Mole. The mayor is afraid there will be a hostile report on what the philanthropists seen. Furthermore, the director of the poorhouse, Mr. Valenod, is the mayor's chief rival and plans to run against the mayor in the next election. To impress and gain favor with the citizens of Verrières, Mayor de Ranal has decided to hire a private tutor for his children. The tutor is a young peasant boy named Julien Sorel, who was recommended by Abbot Chelan. The boy has already declared his intention to enter the seminary. At the moment, Julien is at home with his father. The man has just struck his son for reading instead of working, and then announces that he's to become tutor to the de Renal children. Julien's first thought is that he will be considered a servant, but his father assures him that's not so. Julien arrives at the Renal home and meets Mrs. de Renal, an attractive young woman who is happy to see that Julien is gentle and won't harm her children. Thus, Julien's new life begins. He loves his newly tailored black suit because it gives him the appearance almost of a priest and he's proud when the first evening he's able to demonstrate his knowledge of Latin and the Bible to both the family and the servants. Everyone seems happy to have him there. As the weeks pass, Julien begins to experience different emotions. He realizes that every sign of attention from Mrs. de Renal is felt deeply by him. Every increase of salary feels to him like a humiliation. The three children develop affection for him, and he wants to return that affection, but their happiness reminds him of the wretchedness of his own childhood, and he can only feel envy. His sole preoccupation becomes his ambition to rise in the world, but the one possible obstacle to his plans could be Mrs. de Renal and the place she is beginning to occupy in his thoughts. One summer evening, Julien's hand accidentally touches hers. The next evening, he holds her hand. Fundamentally, he hates Mrs. de Renal because she's rich and beautiful, and he dreads being caught by that beauty. But holding her hand feels like revenge against Mr. de Renal, and he enjoys that. The next day he escapes to the woods, where he sees a hawk circling the sky, and the bird reminds him of Napoleon, strong and alone. He wonders if he will know the same destiny Napoleon knew. That evening he continues the seduction of Mrs. de Renal. He announces to her that he'll come to her room at two in the morning. Although choking with fear, he does go to her room and he makes love to her. Throughout, he never forgets his role of conqueror, and he never completely enjoys himself because he's too concerned with appearing ridiculous in his inexperience. He returns to his room, reviews every step of the seduction, and wonders, is that what is meant by being loved by a woman? Months go by, and one day Verrier is all astir because a king is coming to visit. Mrs. de Renal secures Julien a place in the honor guard, and Mr. de Renal arranges for him to serve as subdeacon to Abbot Chelan for the festivities. Julien is radiant that day. He comes across a young bishop practicing his benediction in front of a mirror, and he's struck by his vanity and also his gracefulness. He is reminded of his ecclesiastical ambitions and for the moment forgets both Napoleon and Mrs. de Renal. Abbot Chelan has heard from a servant of Julien's liaison with Mrs. de Renal and demands that he leave in three days for the seminary. 
Julien agrees because of the power the priest holds and also because the de Renal situation is becoming impossible. He says farewell to Mrs. de Renal, but she, thinking this is the last time she'll ever see him, is cold and her kisses lack warmth. This upsets Julien. Julien is uncomfortable with the seminary, the muted black-robed figures, the long wait before his presence is recognized, the first exchange of words. But the abbot there, Abbot Pirard, recognizes his talents and makes him assistant teacher of the New and Old Testaments. When Abbot Pirard is transferred, he decides to rescue Julien from the glum seminary and gets him an appointment as secretary to the Marquis de la Mole in Paris. Mole is the wealthy benefactor of the village of Verrières. Before going to Paris and against the orders of Abbot Chalon to see no one in Verrières, Julien climbs into Mrs. de Renal's window one night and spends several hours with her. At first they had fought and Julien had had to argue for so long and to use such artifices to win her favor back that the passion he had felt when he entered the room was soon gone. Mrs. de Renal conceals Julien for one more day, but his presence is discovered by Mr. de Renal. On escaping from the house, he is shot at by the servants. Julien arrives in Paris and visits Malmaison, in memory of Napoleon. He weeps at the inspiring source of strength the emperor's image always gives him. His devotion is such that Stendhal the novelist intervenes directly in the narrative and says he cannot relate the emotions as they are expressed. Next, Julien visits Abbot Pirard, who fills him in on the de Mole family. The Marquis is one of the great nobles of France. He is pious, he is a humanist, and he respects the priesthood. His wife is haughty but polite. She sees priests only in terms of her own salvation. Their son, Count Norbert, has been a courageous soldier, is a dandy in dress, witty in speech and somewhat spoiled in life. He believes in the superiority of his class and is scornful of inferiors. Norbert might cause Julien distress, but the priest says he hopes they can become friends. There is also a daughter named Mathilde, but he has nothing to say of her. Julien's principal work will be to write the innumerable letters that have to do with lawsuits. Abbot Pirard also encourages Julien to attend seminary three times a week. The priest then adds that if the de Mole household becomes unbearable, he can come back and serve as vicar in the parish. Tears fill Julien's eyes at this kind offer. He feels he has found a father he never had. He is not aware of the priest's struggle with himself not to love Julien too much. The library at the de Mole house is Julien's domain, and he loves it. The discovery of the eighty volumes of an edition of Voltaire raises his spirits, but the Marquis catches a misspelling in the first letter copied by Julien, and he is made to feel inferior. The first evening he is introduced to Mrs. de Mole, who hardly deigns to look at him at first. But by the end of dinner she considers him with more favor because he has been able to hold his own in a discussion about Latin poets and about Rome. She approves of anyone who can amuse her husband. Julien's knowledge of Horace had once served him well in a conversation with a bishop, and from that conversation he remembered certain ideas about the Latin poets, which he brought into this first conversation with the de Moles. Some of the other dinner guests refer to more modern writers, such as Southey and Lord Byron, and here Julien is at a loss. But he's accepted as a promising Latin humanist in spite of his spelling errors, which the Marquis announces to all present. In the following days, Julien also meets again the young bishop he saw primping before a mirror in Verrières, but the bishop pretends not to recognize this young provincial. One day, Count Norbert, the son of the family, comes to the library to study a newspaper in order to be able to discuss politics in the evening, and is pleased to find Julien there. He has completely forgotten about his presence in the house. Norbert invites Julien to go horseback riding with him, saying, My father has liberated us until dinner time. Julien answers that he's only ridden horseback six times in his life. Norbert replies, so this will be the seventh. Norbert seems gentlemanly and friendly, so Julien goes along. But on the return ride he falls from the horse into the mud in the middle of the street. At dinner the Marquis asks about the ride, and Norbert responds, carefully avoiding any mention of the accident. But Julien confesses his awkwardness, saying there is no way by which the Count could have tied him to the horse. The laughter of Mathilde, the daughter of the house, and the amazement of the Marquis and the others that Julien, before ladies, would confess to his riding disaster were signs he had scored victory. Mathilde begins to look at him more carefully. By the end of the evening the three young people talk freely among themselves and laugh as if they were equals and had known each other all their lives. But as the months go by, Julien turns against everyone, the guests, Count Norbert, and Mathilde. At the same time, the Marquis de la Mole's attachment to Julien deepens. The boy's intelligence impresses him more and more, and he gives him increasingly difficult assignments. 
The Marquis has a blue suit made for Julien, and begins pretending that he is the son of a duke, an old friend of the Marquis. From then on, when Julien dons his black suit, he's treated as a subordinate, but when he wears his blue suit in the evening, he's treated as an equal. A frankness, but a limited frankness, develops between the Marquis and Julien. Julien conceals only two matters from him, his admiration for Napoleon and his skepticism in religion, which would seem unsuitable for a future priest. The Marquis becomes both a father and a teacher to Julien. Whenever he feels ashamed of his attachment to the boy, he excuses it by comparing it to a man's love for his dog. At this point in the story, the Marquis de la Mole begins to occupy an important place in the events of Julien's life. She and her mother return from some months on an island off the coast of Provence. She finds Julien changed, taller, paler, and less provincial than when she left. He treats her with aloofness, and she responds with equal coolness by ordering him to attend a ball being given by the Duke of Retz. There Julien meets a friend of Abbot Pirard, Count Altamira, a Neapolitan whose liberal views please him, and who shares with Julien the same scorn for society. At one point in the evening, Mathilde overhears Julien praising Danton, and the next day in the library she finds him still musing over the political ideas of Danton and Mirabeau. Tactlessly, she asks him, in her words, what has turned him into a kind of Michelangelo prophet. That evening at dinner, Mathilde is the only one dressed in mourning. Julia asks for an explanation. He is told the date is April 30th, and she dresses in black because on that day, in 1574, the lover of Marguerite de Navarre, Boniface de la Mole, was decapitated for having tried to liberate princes imprisoned by Catherine de' Medici. Mathilde, whose full name is Mathilde Marguerite, is most moved by the part of the story in which Marguerite asked the executioner for the head of her lover. The night following the execution, Marguerite took her lover's head with her in a carriage to Montmartre and buried it herself in a chapel at the foot of the hill. The story is a turning point in Julien's opinion of Mathilde. He finds in her a counterpart of himself. Her cult for Boniface de la Mole and her admiration for the entire 16th century and its violence parallels Julien's cult for Napoleon and for the achievements of the Corsican soldier in Europe. He becomes fascinated by her spirit, by the books she reads, by her beauty, by her revolt against the conventionality of her world, and by her refusal to take seriously the mild suitor for her hand, Marquis de Coisnois. When Mathilde leans on Julien's arm, he finds himself wondering if she wants him. He argues back and forth with himself that either she's making a fool of him or that she's wooing him. His fear of being humiliated or tricked is as strong as his desire to attract and even conquer this proud girl, who seems to rule the family. To fall in love with the wrong person, a person of inappropriate social standing, is an exciting challenge for both of them. Julien eventually draws a declaration of love from Mathilde when he announces he's leaving for a while to examine some property at the Marquis. She sends him a letter expressing her feelings for him, which she says are too strong to resist. Julien savors his triumph by contrasting his social position with hers. I, a poor peasant, have received a declaration of love from a grand lady. Julien goes to the Marquis and convinces him that it's not necessary that he take this trip after all, and the Marquis is persuaded. Julien spends several hours enjoying his happiness over his victory in winning Mathilde's love, but then he becomes suspicious. What if her declaration of love is a trick? What if she's playing with him and ridiculing him? He begins to imagine all kinds of plots and machinations against him. He buys a large Bible, hides the letter in it, and sends it to a friend for safekeeping. The next day, after the exchange of more letters, Mathilde writes to him to come to her room at one o'clock that night using a ladder. Julien argues with himself that not to go would be cowardly. In clear moonlight he places the ladder against the house, and full of fear climbs up to Mathilde's room. When he gets to the window it opens, and Mathilde tells him she has been watching him down below for an hour. At first they are embarrassed with each other. The anxiety of waiting and the fear of being caught has cooled their ardor. They talk about love dispassionately, and they end by making love out of a sense of duty. Julien finds himself curious about the absence of happiness in the encounter. Julien's behavior toward Mathilde after that night is guided by Napoleon's precept that the best way to subjugate an enemy is to terrify him. Mathilde agrees with Julien's arguments and urges that he dishonor her. Her acceptance of such an act would be a guarantee of love. The drama between them becomes not one of love but of temperament. Finally, Mathilde tells Julien she's pregnant. This is just the guarantee he needs. Now she is his forever. At first, the Marquis is enraged by the news, but he becomes more generous and gives Julien a lieutenant's appointment and a nobleman's title, Julien Sorel de la Vernay. Then he sends him to Strasbourg with his regiment. There is hope that the marriage will ultimately be consecrated, 
But then the Marquis receives a letter from Mrs. de Renal, which accuses Julien of the worst motivation, the seduction of the woman in the household in order to secure a fortune for himself. Mathilde calls Julien back from Strasbourg and reads him the letter. Julien leaves for Verrières. He arrives in Verrières Sunday morning and purchases a pair of pistols. Then he goes to church during Mass, stands behind the bench of Mrs. de Renal, and at the moment of the elevation, when her head is lowered, he fires two bullets. The first misses her, with the second she falls. Julien is arrested and taken to prison. After a night's sleep, he confesses his guilt to the judge and writes a letter to Mathilde in which he urges her to take no one into confidence and after one year to marry her suitor, Mr. Quasnois. The Julien episode in her life, he assures her, will cure her of her romanticism. From his jailer, Julien learns that Mrs. de Renal didn't die from the bullet wound. In fact, she was only slightly wounded in the shoulder. Unbeknownst to him, she has also sent money to the guards to guarantee that Julien will be treated humanely. He is jubilant over the news she has survived, although he still feels he deserves death. A friend proposes a possible escape from prison, but he refuses it. One morning, the door of his cell opens and Mathilde, dressed as a peasant woman, rushes in. Julien is now a hero of epic proportions, and she too wants a part to play. She gets caught up in a plot for freeing him, while he gets caught up in a wave of nostalgia and makes plans for the care of his child. At the trial, Julien's youthful beauty has an effect on everyone, especially the women in the crowded courtroom but he refuses to say a word in his defense, and his short speech makes it impossible not to convict him of attempted murder. He tells the court he's a peasant in revolt against the limitations of his social position. He expects a just death. His crime had been premeditated and committed against a woman who was kind and generous to him. He also points out that he's being judged not by equals, but by a group of indignant bourgeois. The death penalty is announced immediately. The next day Mathilde tries to have him sign an appeal, but he refuses. Mrs. de Renal visits him and says she was forced to write her letter to the Marquis by her priest confessor. She implies she will take her life when he's executed. She can visit no more because of Mr. de Renal, but Mathilde comes regularly with plans to implore the king for Julien's release. Julien has no desire to be pardoned. During the last days of his life, he has seen the two women he had loved. The sun is magnificent on the day of his execution. As he walks outside, the fresh air exhilarates him. He's proud of the courage he feels in himself. The execution is performed with simplicity, without any trace of affectation. Julien had already drawn a promise from Mrs. de Renal that she would care for Mathilde's son. He had asked to be buried in the cave of the mountain overlooking Verrières, where he first conceived his great ambitions. Mathilde comes to see Julien's body, drawing her strength from the story of Marguerite de Navarre. She places his head on a small marble table and lights candles around it. The next day she accompanies the casket with a large number of priests to the cave, the grotto at the top of the mountain is illuminated by countless candles. Twenty priests celebrate the office of the dead. Mathilde walks among them, distributing coins. Later, Mathilde buries Julien's head herself, just as Marguerite had done with the head of her lover, Boniface de Mole. This is the conclusion of The Red and the Black, in which Stendhal has painted a tragic hero in the classical sense, Julien Sorel, a man crushed by society and forces he cannot combat. Julien is isolated from his own class, turned into an enemy of the bourgeois. He is a servant of the bourgeois who never ceases judging the class he is serving. One of the central themes of the book is the class war. It's the story of a man who penetrates the walls which protect the privileged and attaches himself to a class to which he doesn't belong. He penetrates the walls of the de Renal house, of the seminary and of the La Mole family. In the end, society takes its revenge. It finally shuts him behind prison walls and executes him, not for murder, but for trying to take privileges and stepping over class boundaries. At the end, he refuses to recognize the morality that judges him. He is like the anarchist who, because of the corruption of society, won't consider as sinful any attack he launches against that society. Yet Julien would have been an outsider in any class of society. He's equally out of place in the world of his father, of the Renals, and of the La Moles. Julien is guided by a personal sense of nobility that has nothing to do with the ruling class or any other class. His drives for ambition are all motivated by his desire to live apart from the ugly and the mean. He hesitates between wearing the red cape of the soldier and the black cassock of a priest. He moves from one class to another, and because he vacillates, he is struck down. Both Julien and Stendhal himself lived in the belief that beyond the meanness of men there must exist a life of happiness. Such a man's search for happiness is destined to uncover terrifying evidence of evil in human nature. Stendhal's sympathy for Julien is evident throughout the book. 
He seems to place his hero, defeated by fate, as high as the figure of Napoleon. The man condemned by society is as courageous in his way as the emperor. Julien's fate is presented as an accusation against his age, but he is also the young man of every age who refuses to submit to the social and political conservatism of his times, whose intellect and ambitions have no channel in a restrictive environment. Perhaps this is why Stendhal always said that his books were written for the future, and that in the future would be his fame and recognition. This is the end of the session. The hero of Le Bellisme is a man who follows the lead of his senses and his instincts. He's seen as a member of a social group or on the margin of a social group, but he never bends to the rules that society tries to impose on him. Every one of Stendhal's heroes is in opposition to the social world in which he lives and serves. These heroes constantly cast doubt over every habit and characteristic of society. Because of this distrust, the hero makes many small discoveries by which he accumulates facts, and those facts lead to his sense of reality. Sentiments and morality have no role in these discoveries. They are only obstacles in an objective search for happiness. If man is to achieve happiness, he must calculate his moves, estimate his chances, practice flattery, and build his own happiness based on what he knows of the ways of man and his skill at exploiting those ways. This is Stendhal's philosophy, the theme of his books, and the approach that defines le bellisme. The philosophy of Stendhal can be traced in part to the chaotic times in which he lived. His life bridged two centuries in a way that none of his contemporaries did. He was born in the 18th century and died well into the 19th century. His birth occurred a few years before the French Revolution. He grew up during a time of violent upheaval. He went to school under the Directory, became an adolescent with the Consulate, reached manhood under the Empire of Napoleon, participated in the Napoleonic disaster in Russia, wrote half of his books under the Restoration and the other half during the July Monarchy, and died only a few years before another revolutionary storm was to shake France in 1842. Most of the other significant writers of his time were born after the Revolution and were still boys when Napoleon fell. His unique experiences always increased Stendhal's sense of homelessness and his tragic awareness of time and change. He therefore became one of the first writers to speak for the so-called homeless, the intellectuals and searchers who lived on the margins of society, a society that was always in flux, but which had one consistent characteristic, the abuse of power. His heroes are condemned by society and often, like Julien Sorel and the Red and the Black, end up in prison. But they have found their dignity and their salvation in not playing the game of this society and in accepting their own private prisons. They are strangers in society who struggle for independence and survival with whatever weapons they have. These weapons may not always be noble, they may include hypocrisy or role-playing, but they protect the hero's truest beliefs and opinions which have no outlet in society. Although he wrote throughout most of his life, Stendhal didn't begin writing novels until later in life. He published his first one, Armand's, when he was forty-four. He was forty-seven when he wrote The Red and the Black, and he wrote his last novel, La Chartreuse de Parme, when he was fifty-six. Each of these three important novels are about young men. His stories explore the aspirations and disappointments of the coming of age. They're about the young man's first impressions of life, his first important ideas, and the first awareness of his sensuality. Young readers are always able to identify with the three heroes from these books, and older readers are impressed by the intelligence and accuracy with which Stendhal portrays youth. The story of Julien Sorel, the hero of the Red and the Black, is a rich treatment of human life that was neither recognized nor appreciated by the readers and critics of the time. The book was considered evil, immoral, and irresponsible. Its true greatness would be realized years later, as Stendhal himself predicted. The title of the book has a surface meaning and several deeper meanings, depending on your interpretation. On the surface, red is meant to refer to the color of the uniforms of Napoleon's soldiers. Black is the color of the robes of the clergy. The hero, Julien Sorel, was... Welcome. In this session of IntelliQuest's The World's 100 Greatest Books, you're going to learn about the classic novel The Red and the Black and its intense and fascinating author, Stendhal. Stendhal is actually a pseudonym. The author's real name was Henri Bale, but it was one of his quirks of character that he frequently used different aliases, 171 of them over his lifetime. While writing The Red and the Black, he was calling himself Baron Stendhal, even though there was an actual Baron Stendhal living in Sweden at the time. He claims to have taken the name Stendhal not from this man, but from a town in Germany. Stendhal created a style and philosophy in his books which he himself gave a name to. 
He called it le Bélisme, after his family name of Bail. It describes the method of his books, a sense of style and composition that was all his own. It also describes his major theme, the search for happiness.